My talk tonight is really about the past, the present, and the future. This is one of the, I think, one of the most extraordinary stories of our time, and it's, it's got a lot of stories that go backwards and forwards. In terms of the past, this is one of the, the greatest new insights into one of the, the most interesting Americans. In terms of the present, uh, this is our own story of what we're doing at Poplar Forest, um, the process of discovery, of restoration. And in terms of the future, uh, those stories are all about the values of the past, uh, what today we would call heritage versus history. Heritage is the things we bring along with each generation from history or about history projected into the future. And in terms of Thomas Jefferson, he's always been in the news, uh, no matter whether it's good news or bad news. Uh, every generation has seen something about him to either love or hate. Um, but he's still there. You know, year after year, he manages to get into the newspaper. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad news. Uh, all the other founding fathers and uh, early heroes who don't get in the news are kind of left behind. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, the lost and found. Okay, let me see if I can get the right projector. Okay. I want to talk about lost and found episodes of history. Poplar Forest was a secret in Jefferson's lifetime, one he, he tried hard to protect. It's been lost in histories. Uh, you know, most recently there was a, a book written about Jefferson's character that didn't mention Poplar Forest. This is probably the best place to see his uh, character uh, without any pretense, to see his most intimate self. There was another history book written in the last five years of 600 pages. It had one sentence about Poplar Forest. Um, this has been overlooked in Jeffersonian histories, but overlooked in current and, and public knowledge. This is about unraveling, I'm sorry, let me back up there. This is about unraveling the mysteries of this story, and there indeed have been many. It's about putting the pieces of a puzzle together finding many of those little jigsaw pieces, but we, don't, we didn't have the, the big picture to tell us what the pieces should look like. It's also about fathoming the depths of Thomas Jefferson, which seems to be an endless challenge. Um, you know, how many books come out each year? You know, probably at least a half a dozen on Jeffersonian themes. Uh, there seems to be no end. Uh, well, this is a whole new world for future researchers to, to fathom. This is the Thomas Jefferson that you know. This is the man who was reluctantly dragged into politics and kept there for about 30 years. Uh, we know about Jefferson's public life. That's, that's his claim to fame. This is the Jefferson you don't know. This is what I'm going to talk about tonight. This is the, the Jefferson that retired from the second term as president in 1809 and had a whole life after public life, but you don't usually hear about that. And for 14 years of that, that life, uh, he spent at Poplar Forest occasionally. And those are really uh, kind of the, the secret, uh, now disclosed parts of his life that, that have uh, very many relevant meanings. Uh, one way to put it is uh, Poplar Forest is kind of the rest of his life, the, the, the life of a private citizen, not a public figure. And that's why he needed Poplar Forest, uh, is to get away from the public. What if I told you that uh, there was a second house that Jefferson designed 
lived in, loved, and that this unknown house was one of his most intimate works of architecture. It represented his lifelong dreams for a private villa retreat. It was his most idealistic house and perhaps his most perfect work of architecture. What if I told you that this is about the most new information about Jefferson in over a century, literally dug up in the ground, in the walls, in the records? What did Thomas Jefferson say about this place that was, that was very dear to him, that he'd waited a lifetime for? He called it the most valuable of my possessions. He said, when finished, it will be the best dwelling house in the state, except that of Monticello, but perhaps preferable to that, as more proportioned to the faculties of a private citizen. And I, I think that says a lot. But let's uh, go back to the, the beginning. Uh, you'll have to yell out if these things look out of focus, because they all look out of focus from here. Uh, let's go back and give you a little bit of background before I tell you about more of the story. Jefferson inherited the land poplar forest from his wife when her father died in 1773. It was a 5,000 acre plantation here in central Virginia on the edge of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's really the edge of the genteel world at that time. Jefferson never went past the Allegheny Mountains, which is the next chain over, uh, but he liked to, to think, I think, uh, he liked to believe that Poplar Forest was on the edge of that unknown continent. Uh, Lewis and Clark hadn't gone out yet. And in fact, in the only book Jefferson wrote, uh, which was mostly written at Poplar Forest when uh, he was chased out of Charlottesville by the British, who would have liked this head um, holed up in an overseer's house at the time. He wrote most of Notes on the State of Virginia. And in that book, uh, he talks about nature. Uh, and he particularly found nature very close at Poplar Forest. In Notes on Virginia, he called the nearby peaks of Otter the highest peaks of North America. Nearby was one of the two greatest natural wonders of America for the time. What was the other? I think East Coast. Niagara Falls. Uh, the Natural Bridge was actually a sacred Indian site. The year after Jefferson inherits Poplar Forest, he actually buys this from the King of England. He had to have it. He calls this the most sublime of nature's wonders. This is the first image that we can definitely say was his house for Poplar Forest. Uh, and this is as early as 1781, which means he was designing something for that site very early on. Uh, this is while he's governor of Virginia. And up on the very top left, it says plan for Bedford, meaning Bedford County. And indeed, in this plat, uh, you can see that, that plan right here, but what's this? Uh, another plan appears later, and this happens to be what he finally did, his octagonal house. Uh, this is probably a good time to quickly orient you. Uh, this is a, a large octagon. This is the front uh, with the portico, an entry passage, a dining room, which is unusual uh, to walk into a dining room, a parlor. So you really only have two what we call public rooms. This is a large bedchamber, a bedchamber. During construction, he writes and adds this portico, this portico, that stair pavilion, and that stair pavilion, and two doors, uh, which are not shown on here. And 
what we can surmise from adding those things, which are, are needed, is that he starts off with a very idealistic octagon. In fact, there is just a, an octagon in his drawings that had some features of poplar forest. Uh, so from the very beginning, it's, it's idealistic, adapted by practicality. Uh, the whole thing is, is, is a large octagonal theme, the ultimate octagon in Jefferson's lifetime of those shapes. Um, it's got four chimneys that serve 15 fireplaces. The ground floor is the exact same shape, uh, whereas this dining room was a 20-foot cube, 20 by 20 by 20. This room below, on the lower level, was a 20-foot square wine cellar that went deeper instead of taller. Um, the porticos, uh, this is the access from the front. This portico has no stairs. It's just an elevated portico. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the plan later, but that's the basic shape and, and scheme of it. And the, the story of how things are done by Jefferson, really by anybody at that time, is, is very interesting, and we don't think about it. Uh, we're so used to having things available and turnkey. Uh, the interesting story is that Jefferson is still president up here when the house starts. It starts in 1806, timed so that the year he leaves the presidency, 1809, he can start using poplar forest. He can't wait to, to get out of the public into the private. Monticello, his primary residence, is where his trained workers and workshops are. Poplar Forest is way down here on the, the edge of things. Uh, from Monticello to Poplar Forest was a three-day journey of 90 miles. Uh, Richmond is the port of Virginia. Many things Jefferson ordered had to come by ship through the Chesapeake Bay to Richmond, where the fall line is, and then be pulled upriver to Poplar Forest or to Monticello and then upriver to Poplar Forest. It's a very heroic episode of building, uh, fascinating in the letters. Fortunately, Jefferson is in Washington at the White House because he has to correspond to the workers, hired and enslaved, to build the house. Uh, if he had been there, uh, we wouldn't have all these incredible letters. Uh, you know, decimal points that are really ridiculous for a rough carpenter. Uh, but Jefferson was into, definitely into math. This is describing the, uh, the, the peros or zigzag roof over the, the middle room. And here's the, the journey uh, from Monticello for things going by wagon. And typically, things were made at Monticello like doors, window frames, and sash, and cart it down to Monticello, fragile things going by boat. And here's that route if they have to come into Richmond. Um, these would be pulled upriver against currents and rocks. Okay, lost my control here. on these very shallow bateau boats that were carrying tobacco down river from the gathering place at Lynchburg. Very uh, tough journey. Or overland by wagons and carts. Uh, I never could figure out why Jefferson always says, don't keep the wagon more than one day at Poplar Forest. We need it at Monticello. Don't keep the cart more than you need it. It seemed to me that they were using one cart and one wagon for all these years, you know, why not build another wagon and cart? He was having fine carriages made by his craftsmen. And when I looked at his uh, inventory at his death, you know, near the bottom was one wagon and one cart. I can't figure that one out. <laughs> uh, and it's a back and forth story of workers and materials going back and forth year after year. 
So uh, what do we have here? It's a, it's a remarkable result, but what, how did we get there? What I'd like to do is, uh, for, for those not seeped in Jefferson, give you a, a very short uh, story about Jefferson and his architectural background, which has relevance for poplar forest. Um, as a student, either uh, private tutoring or as a college student at the, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg in the 1760s, Jefferson, like all of educated uh, people of his day, studied the classical world. In fact, you could say that uh, people of Jefferson's time knew the classical world better than they knew their own county. Uh, they read everything about it, knew everything about it. Jefferson had a, a very early love for mathematics, which I think is his love of octagons. Here in one of his sketches, how to draw the sides of an octagon. Uh, that becomes a theme throughout his whole life. He also, as a college student, starts buying architectural handbooks from a, a merchant down on the corner near the college. And he starts to read and study these as much as anything else he's studying at the college. Um, Palladio introduces him to the whole tradition of, of neoclassical, classical and then neoclassical architecture. He also buys a number of books. I'm not sure we're, why we're not getting this. I wonder if we could s switch our doodad here. Uh, Jefferson is uh, buying different books and, uh, for instance, taking this round Temple of Vesta from Palladio and making it into an octagonal chapel for Williamsburg. Uh, this is the beginning of him mixing and matching things. He, he never took anything straight. Uh, he always had to adapt it. And all the British Palladian books that he's buying are, are really more relevant uh, in some ways because they're filled with octagons. There's, I think, one octagonal design in Palladio, and it was not of his design. The British Palladian books are filled with octagons, uh, they, of course, are reinterpreting Palladio, who's reinterpreting Rome, and Jefferson's reinterpreting the British Palladians, uh, and that's a long lecture. Uh, so the first Monticello, which is considered one of the first really learned houses of proper architecture in Virginia, is really bookish. It's, it's done out of books. Uh, nevertheless, a, a wonderful house. And it has this floor plan, very simple. Uh, and that's sort of the beginning of that plan he attempted at Poplar Forest. A big part of his experience, though, comes from the foreign, uh, the five years in Paris when he's a minister there in the 1780s. Paris is incredibly exciting to a country boy who's you know, known uh, the big places like Williamsburg. Um, it's also very exciting for other reasons. It's on the eve of the revolution, and it's very stimulating for Jefferson in, in all aspects. But he tends to pay attention to practical things, um, not the visionary architects, but uh, practical things like how do you span this space with this incredible dome, free, free space with skylights, the hall au blé, the, the grain hall. Uh, he really wanted to latch on to practical technology. I must not have the right thumb tonight. Uh, oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Can we switch controllers or? Uh, Anyway, Paris was so full of distractions that it's almost like Jefferson has blinders on and out of all of his writings doesn't mention so many things that you'd love to hear his opinion on. He really zeroes in on the things he thinks are practical that can be brought back to America. And a lot of these ideas end up in the second Monticello in Poplar Forest 
uh, University of Virginia. And what he looks at is uh, technology. Uh, he's fascinated by the latest in comforts and conveniences. I hit the, oh, you want me to try it? Yeah. The same one or the other side? OK. Uh, that's how you span a large space uh, with little pieces of wood, the Delorme method which he brings back and uses for all of his domes, uh, the Dome of Monticello, the Dome of the Rotunda. Uh, he's also amazed, as everybody, all the other foreign visitors, of uh, the world's first indoor shopping malls with these incredible expanses of glass. This is the 1780s. Uh, he, he loves the, the apartments, uh, which is the uh, the inside of the French townhouses that are called hotels. Uh, he loves the, all the different ways to get in and out, which is not like that, that uh, bookish Palladian plan. He stares at the, the Hotel de Somme every day, uh, watching its construction uh, and, and picking up ideas about what he does when he gets back. He also gets a chance to actually see a Roman building in Nîmes, the Maison Carré, which of course is known as the prototype for the Virginia State Capitol in Richmond, uh, a model of which he had made and sent back, and uh, supposedly the first neoclassical public building in the Western world, certainly a model for our country. So after Paris, he takes this first Monticello and makes it into the rebuilt, uh, highly more complicated Monticello, much more like the, the French houses uh, with alcove beds uh, and, of course, octagons. And here you see on the front of Monticello, he's incorporating that low, horizontal, deceptive look of the front. Um, gotta be careful not to hit you in the eye with the laser. Uh, on the back of Monticello, it's a different face. While the front he would call modern, and he used that term, the back he would call ancient. Uh, this is the nickel view. This is the ancient face, meaning Rome, the dome, um, and what happens at Poplar Forest. He has, he cuts the house into a hillside so the front looks lower, and the back, uh, which is on the right, a, a full two-story. So that's a, a very brief um, synopsis of some of the ideas that go into his architecture. What happened to Poplar Forest over time? Well, Jefferson stopped going there in 1823 when he got a little bit infirm, uh, but in that year puts his grandson, Francis Epps, the son of his daughter who died in childbirth, and Francis and his bride start living in Poplar Forest. They live there for five years, uh, but on his deathbed in 1826, Jefferson is still directing the last ornament to be put on the parlor wall. Uh, so I consider his, his period here to be his death because he's still in control of finishing the house. Um, I think finally when he's about ready to die, he realizes and he might as well finish the house, as, as much fun as it's been. Houses obviously change over time, and uh, Poplar Forest sure did. Uh, and this is part of the story of, of rediscovering the Jefferson House. This is around 1900, um, and you can see the, the vagaries of time. Uh, the house had a fire in 1845. Well, let me back up. Jefferson's grandson really did not like Poplar Forest. It was remote. His wife probably complained. Uh, and Virginia was very depressed at the time. So instead of going south or west like his cousins and friends, he went to Florida in 1828 into the wilderness to live in a log cabin. Uh, eventually became one of the founders of Tallahassee and became a big man. but. 
Uh, he left one of the, the greatest houses uh, to live in a log cabin. After that fire, in fact, uh, right after the fire, a, a relative of the Cobbs Hutter family who bought the house from Francis wrote and said, we're sorry to hear about your fire, but we now understand you can make some valuable improvements in the house. What did that mean? Well, that meant that an idiosyncratic, occasional, idealistic villa for one man didn't work for a farm family uh, who just wanted a good old farmhouse. Uh, but they also took the uh, opportunity to update Jefferson's Roman classicism with Greek Revival classicism. Uh, and uh, this 20-foot ceiling here uh, gets reduced to 12 feet, and, and many, many other things happen to the house to make it un-Jeffersonian. Um, it's still a plantation. Uh, Jefferson had actually managed to switch from tobacco, which he, he didn't like because of what it did to the soil and the labor-intensive nature, to wheat, um, which was just as good a cash crop later on. Uh, Poplar Forest was always in the middle of this large agricultural setting. Uh, and in a 1985 Hab set of drawings, uh, you can see this middle room that used to go up to there is changed. This room, which used to go down to there, has been changed. Many, many other things that we can't go into. Uh, but the significant thing about the, the cube room changing was instead of that wonderful cube room, the, the perfect space, 20 by 20 by 20, uh, the later family would rather have a big attic uh, for more family, more visitors, for storage. Uh, so they, they lower the ceiling and put in this attic floor. Um, by, the 19, by 1945, a, what we call the modern family buys the house. Uh, there are still things, Jeffersonian, we believe these Kentucky coffee trees that form an alley are planted by Jefferson. You still have the sunken lawn, but all these trees are cleaned up as that family cleans the farmyard to make this a country house uh, in the mid-19th century country house movement. Uh, and they also, you know, clean up other things uh, inadvertently around that five-acre core that I'll talk about later. They also uh, employ a, a New York City architect to restore the house. Um, by a little bit of research, I, I uncovered in Greenwich, Connecticut, over 100 drawings of this architect who planned to do incredible things with Poplar Forest. Most of them wrong. So it's, uh, it's kind of good that the family ran short of cash, but nevertheless, you got five bathrooms, um, dressing rooms where the stairs used to be. You got kitchens, closets, uh, all sorts of things that we need in modern life. But they did do one room, the parlor. They restored this uh, Jefferson, Jefferson-like, um, but... Uh, you know, not looking real hard for, for evidence. Um, the rescue part of this story is in 1983 when a, a group of five citizens answer an editorial in the local paper, who's going to save Poplar Forest? Five people show up and they look around and they say, I guess we're it. Uh, they managed to convince a bank to give them over a million dollars. They co-sign the note, and they start off uh, with the immediate need to raise money. So this is what uh, I first saw in 1989. And my challenge was, what's Jefferson that's there? Uh, the thing didn't look very Jeffersonian. Uh, it just had parts that didn't make sense. And this is probably why uh, some architectural historians who actually knew and visited Poplar Forest didn't get real excited about it. There were immediate needs of just keeping the place up, uh, emergency stabilization work. And then began the, uh, the problem of, of 
of how to unravel all those mysteries. Uh, first, starting with the surface work, uh, then looking at stylistic work. Uh, for instance, uh, this doorway has been widened that much on each side and made taller that much for what, what was a typical Greek Revival doorway. Uh, looking at things that didn't quite add up on the outside, uh, knowing the Jeffersonian system of classicism and all the parts and where they should be. Uh, we then had to go into a little more extensive archaeology in the house. And at this time, uh, not saying that we were going to restore the house to Jefferson, we were only going to look to see if there was enough evidence to restore Jefferson. So always keeping in mind that what we took off might go back. If we didn't find enough, it would be the vernacular farmhouse that we would interpret. Uh, and so, slowly, uh, things were uncovered, uh, fireplace covered for 150 years, uh, things were opened up, uh, evidence about the floor and the basement hiding under the slab, um, a lot of material analysis. There are up to five periods of plaster in the house to figure out. Um, Things, this is that wall that had all the lumps and bumps on it. Uh, and there's actually, you know, you could find original Jefferson plaster. That, for instance, has a, a finished white coat of plaster, no paint or paper, which is interesting as a hierarchy. Um, ghost marks of where pieces of trim used to be all through the house. Uh, the remnants of Jefferson plaster usually called out the sizes and the placements of trim that was there before the plaster. Reading the whole house eventually as a, a big document that had to be matched to all those wonderful letters. Uh, and in terms of the letters, if you only got Jefferson's letter to the workmen, it was, it was incredible to have that. But uh, if you had the worker's letter back to Jefferson, uh, that gave you the, the reality and fortunately, he kept all those letters, and he had a, a little two-pin machine that made two originals of everything he wrote. A lot of documentation of, of many types and sorts uh, done the old-fashioned way. Uh, I was just at a meeting recently talking about uh, how archival is all the new scanning technology and electronic data. Well. Fortunately, I have the uh, hard copy stuff that we can turn into electronic images, but that's my archival copy. Um, every little detail became a, a big part of the story because we were given the, the time with the right attitude to that we didn't have a schedule in figuring out these answers. Uh, we would do it until it was done correctly. So we had a chance to look at walls uh, a dozen times over. Uh, and you usually, if you don't have the question, uh, you can stare at the answer and it doesn't tell you anything. On the other hand, we found a lot of answers but didn't know the question. Uh, like I said, it was, it was turning up more mysteries than not. Uh, consultants doing specialized work, analyzing uh, plaster fa fragments. Um, those plaster fragments were found in a, a, under a hearthstone that was bedded after the fire using fire debris as the bedding material, uh, giving us two wonderful uh, examples of what the entablatures had been made out of uh, in numbered pieces, what color they were painted, how they were put together, and enough plaster fragments to give us uh, six or maybe seven colors of the house, of the plaster walls, all pigmented lime washes, pastel colors. We slowly built the house on paper as if we were doing working drawings. It either works or it doesn't work on paper. Uh, in six month stages, I would give details to consulting architects who would draw it up, and then we convene an advisory panel and we'd chew on it and see where we knew something and where we didn't, uh, and always having the luxury of time that most projects don't. Um, a very good peer review panel, hard working, uh, questioning, and uh, very conscientious. Uh, while 
all these things were going on architecturally. My counterpart in archaeology was uh, trying to unravel the mysteries of the site. This is about a, a five acre core, uh, which is in a bigger yard called a curtilage of, of 61 acres, which is in the middle of the 5,000 acre plantation. Uh, Archaeology discovered uh, plantings of ornamental flowers, shrubs, bushes, um, all placed strategically. Um, slave quarter sites uh, that were very uh, informative. After about 1800, Jefferson starts rearranging the plantation landscape after doing the ornamental one. And uh, doing a lot of landscape archaeology, which had really started at, at Monticello and, uh, and quickly continued at Poplar Forest. Uh, this was shrub day, where we put uh, the right shrubs that we knew he planted in the exact holes where they had been, or on the, on the holes, uh, the intervals, just to see what it looked like. Um, and then all sorts of other features I, I can't explain right now, but a lot of landscape work. The house itself had really gone through the ringer for environmental reasons. Um, by cutting the hill, Jefferson put the house in a bowl, and from day one, uh, water problems in the basement. Uh, deteriorated brick, frost heave, uh, plaster and mortar that was gone. These are all basement shots. A real nightmare of conservation. Uh, biting the bullet, underpin the house, put in waterproof membranes and two drainage systems, and uh, that solved that problem, although it was not nice to go through. Uh, unraveling the brick is, uh, was kind of a scary thing. Each time he took out this Portland cement mortar, uh, he realized there was nothing behind it and everything started falling apart. A lot of conservation masonry, uh, some problems due to some shortcuts by the bricklayer. Jefferson was not there for two years during the brickwork. Um, structural cracks related to the settling that kept going on. Uh, without just taking wholesale pieces out and putting them back, a lot of time spent taking out certain bricks inside and outside to make that, that wall structurally sound and always putting them back in the same place not removing any more fabric than we had to, uh, repairing broken bricks, uh, adding to it instead of taking it out, uh, really a brick by brick project. Uh, this whole face was missing, that's a new material that imitates all the others. It's a conservative method of fixing bricks. Uh, one, one story that's worth talking about, uh, Jefferson and Columns is, is a story throughout his lifetime. He always struggled to get proper columns. These did not look right uh, when we found them like this. This looked a little chunky up here. Uh, certainly had lost all of its crisp moldings on this Tuscan order. Uh, conservation starting from the ground up to keep these things standing first. And then uh, after pulling off the Portland cement uh, shapes, uh, finding what was left of the original shapes, conserving those by, uh, for instance, missing faces, but these are still in good mortar, uh, adding to those uh, with the special material. Uh, the capitals were, in some cases, uh, as bad as the, the bases. Uh, relearning the art of, of molding the columns uh, brick columns to look like stone columns. Here's a little piece that's been added of, of that little uh, molding. And getting into some what we thought were lost arts. You know, how do you render brick columns uh, with a, uh, a rendering or a stucco, uh, purely lime-based, uh, that has the right emphasis and also is protecting the remnants on here of the original Jefferson material which had been recovered twice. Um, a long process, but uh, we think done exactly like Jefferson had done it. And I think in the end, uh, beautiful columns that would make you think they're turned out of a single piece of stone, which is what the intention was. 
Um, the bricklayer, Hugh Chisholm, um, actually got these wrong. Uh, they are correct in vertical divisions, according to Palladio, but the thickness of the shaft is too skinny. And we know that Jefferson lived with it. Uh, he must have, have really had a fit over it. But he lived with it. And we do not try to make it better or worse. We try to, to do the same character. Uh, on we go from the, the brickwork up through the roof. Uh, one of the, the key features of this whole project is keeping it open through all this work. Visitors were, were literally reliving a Jeffersonian construction project, which no one had done since the 1820s. With no roofs, no floors, no walls, people came through here and were fascinated. Um, Watching the old technology, I think, really connects people to the past, especially if they're seeing it done. They become part of that, and it, it provides an intangible link to the past, I think. Um, you know, Looking at a piece of 12 by 12 white oak that's 23 feet long with another 12 by 12 and a 6 by 10, and you know, our modern eyes are not accustomed to seeing this stuff, and it's uh, people are fascinated by the, the education of how you construct a house. Um, all this based on documented uh, evidence of one type or another. Uh, white oak used for structural framing members. Pine used for uh, usually finished material. Uh, Jefferson's real uh, peculiar way of getting a flat roof that drained water, which he probably saw in, in uh, Paris, uh, with, uh, on top of which was, I think, the largest skylight in America, 16 feet long. Skylights were all over Parisian houses and, and some European houses, and very rare in America. Uh, together, you know, there are many interesting stories. He, Jefferson does these flat roofs at least eight times in his life never the same way twice. This is a very interesting story of Jefferson, the contractor, the construction manager, the builder. Uh, so many stories that we've learned about how he builds. Um, stories of, of trying to get the same material he used, uh, using the same technologies, um, having the problems with getting the right workers like he did, getting things transported to the site. Uh, you name it, and we followed his problems. Um, he switched to this interesting tin-coated, very thin Welsh iron shingle uh, late in his life, uh, replacing chestnut shingles. Uh, we know about this Chinese railing simply in one letter from John John Hemmings, the, the best craftsman, who said, I've just finished replacing the Chinese railing uh, after this chimney uh, burned off part of the roof. Uh, that's the only way we knew about that. Fortunately, Jefferson had designs for it in other places. Uh, getting English trained lead workers. Once you start down the road to doing it right, whether anybody knows it's right or not, uh, you really can't deviate. So it doesn't matter if people see it, uh, you do it. Uh, for the integrity of the project. Uh, the same kind of joinery after studying Jefferson's other works. You can go around and see his workers at different projects. Same workers, the same tools. Uh, some physical evidence known solely by what was on the wall. Um, all the windows and doors made just like the ones at Monticello because these were made at the same time as those at Monticello by the Irish craftsman Dinsmore. Uh, interestingly, uh, those basement windows I just showed you, he, he said, do them out of pine. He said to do these out of walnut with the inside varnished because it gives a richer look. Uh, at Monticello, he does that out of mahogany. Um, reproduction glass out of Germany that imitates two types he always had in windows. Uh, a new Jeffersonian color. Uh, there was one louver found in the Monticello attic that was uh, analyzed and first the color first used at Poplar Forest. He called it a grass green. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, not knowing some joinery details like this passage wall, 
Uh, we can go look at Carpenter John Perry's work at Monticello, where he just finished roof framing and wall framing. We could go look at uh, the first pavilion at, at the University of Virginia, which he does after Poplar Forest. John Perry in the same bricklayer did this. You can see John Perry's work didn't vary from house or building one and building three. So we did it in building two, uh, along with all the idiosyncrasies. Um, wonderful faux grain doors that were done at Monticello. Jefferson always did faux grain exterior doors. Pine, grain that looked like mahogany with inlay and burl. Uh, handmade hardware. Uh, most of the iron hardware made at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, most recently, adding some more of the the openness, the light and airy feeling by adding these sash doors uh, next to a pair of, of solid doors. You can have it open, solid, or glass. Uh, a wonderful combination, especially in this parlor where he's trying to make the wall disappear by floor-to-ceiling windows and doors. Um, the quality of light was enhanced by the skylight, but these blinds, just like the window blinds, and these uh, pieces of hardware based on archaeological findings uh, led uh, the granddaughter to say that the middle cube room in the summer was deliciously cool. Um, a lot of low-tech technology. Uh, searches for things like this sash cord uh, that I had to get custom made in Holland because uh, we don't use hemp for agricultural purposes anymore. Um, and they've never stopped using it. Hemp, the, the world's strongest natural fiber, for these little skinny ropes. Uh, Jefferson grew hemp at both plantations. Uh, just recently, the restoration of two wonderful little temples of convenience, two privies that are Palladian in their proportions to an eighth of an inch. Uh, wonderful little domed. We just put chestnut shingles back on here, and it, it was not easy or cheap to get chestnut. Uh, restored the lunette windows. This one happens to have the original seat, our most intimate object on the site. Um, when we can, using traditional craftsmanship, um, people are always fascinated with this type of thing. And in the future, uh, well, just a second. Uh, another uh, back-breaking labor was of scraping these these oak boards smooth with little pieces of metal, uh, as in the 18th century method of smoothing wood. Uh, as far as I can tell, one of the earliest or the earliest house in America with European style stained and polished oak floors. Jefferson had never done any. Uh, when he writes the workers, giving them all the details of how to do this herringbone, he says, all the best houses of Europe have oak floors. And indeed, this would look uh, simplistic compared to what he saw. Uh, a, a really good luck story uh, of uh, getting donated to us an antique tool collection of 471 pieces, uh, about a third of which are Jefferson era, that we will use to do all the trim work from here on out. Uh, we will trim out a room by hand in that room. Uh, as soon as the roof was on the house, Jefferson lived in the workshop and did it for 14 years. We will try to recreate that experience as visitors walk around. We'll be there doing things the hard way, uh, but the, the wonderful way. We, we've not only learned, uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is about uh, uh, mortar. Uh, getting this reproduction mortar to look like that old mortar. Uh, this is a long story that I'll give you a quick uh, glimpse at. Uh, starting from scratch about eight years ago of using pure lime mortar, uh, having to reproduce Jefferson's sand source because we never could find the original. But eventually turning to more authenticity. Instead of using lime out of the bag, which we now know doesn't have the properties of old traditional lime, our mason started uh, experimenting, building lime kilns, finally got them to work, fires this 98% calcium limestone that's from the area uh, with wood for about 24 hours. Uh, you then 
add back the water that you've burned off. You then keep mixing that uh, to get it finer and finer and finer until it's about the consistency of yogurt. Uh, you then store it in underground pits for as long as you can. You know, years and years would not be long enough. But you, you hopefully want to get it in there for months or at least a year. Uh, we found out that this stuff is far superior to trying to make modern materials work like the traditional materials. Uh, but you can imagine that whole process of uh, hourly paid specialist masons who work day to day for about seven years is, is not a cheap proposition. Uh, do I just switch to the other? Uh, the power is on? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, just a few more things about the process, and I'll, I'll talk about what this all means. Uh, materials are always a huge part of the story for Jefferson and for us. Uh, Jefferson put the house right up against what's left of the Poplar Forest, which is a place name going back to at least to the 1740s. People in this region called it the forest because everybody knew what they were talking about, a very venerable part of nature. Um, there are five of these tulip poplar trees left out of the forest. And to get that kind of wood, uh, old growth wood, you'd have to cut them down. Well, one of them did come down, and unlike the, the rest, it had good usable wood. Uh, these things were so big that this four-foot chainsaw had to quarter it uh, and then trim it in order to get it into a saw. This is one quarter of a log. Uh, wonderful heart poplar, all heartwood. Uh, this is what you can't go down and get at your Lowe's store. Uh, another important story uh, that I think is the last frontier of house museums today, and that's systems, climate control. Usually what's good for the furniture, the artifacts, and the people is not good for your biggest artifact, the house. And there are many curatorial battles about this. Um, I think it's very important to have that added sense of, of feeling uh, realism. Uh, that means you use the windows, you use your climate control in the summer, which means you have to open them over here and close them over here and close them over here and open them over here all day long. Uh, but you know, you're there in the summer and, hey, Jefferson was hot in this house. Uh, he was a little cold here in the winter. We can do that because we don't have the furniture. We can leave the windows open with the dust and the bugs. For cooling, at Monticello, we seized on this idea of this air tunnel. Jefferson had 200-foot air tunnels. They weren't for cooling. They were for ventilating the privies inside the house. And it occurred to me once uh, in the privy space off his bedroom that in the middle of the summer, the, the, the place was air conditioned because you had a tall shaft uh, going to one of those chimneys that sucked air pulling the cool air that was cooled by the ground. And we thought, you know, why not? Let's, let's do something like that, low tech. Um, a very complicated, innovative system to avoid damaging original fabric or intrusions uh, and trying to keep things natural. Um, four 12-inch tubes underground that just come up a little, even shorter than that, under the two stairways that have an opening. With a velocity, that air is pushed upstairs and enters the main house, even if the windows are open. Uh, the stuff that operates that is 350 feet away from the house out in the field in an almost uh, unnoticeable place. Uh, with a little high grass here, uh, this entrance to the vault probably won't be seen. Heating system, not, not real innovative, but uh, good for our purposes. Hot water radiant heat coming from that pump house, uh, radiating through these oak floors that are an inch and an eighth thick quarter sawn. 
Uh, and how do you hide this from looking at the basement uh, and the insulation? You put in Jefferson's system of, of boards that span each joist in which he filled with brick and mortar to make it fireproof. And it probably was soundproof, insulated, and rat-proof at the same time. Uh, this looks right, and it hides this, uh, and it was very a good solution. Also, under the new brick floors of the basement, hot water, radiant heat, operated uh, from that pump house with geothermal wells, two heat pumps, small supplemental heater, and little pumps that serve five zones. Um, all operated by a computer that has seven modes of operation, automatic, and it has been, uh, has not been without bugs, uh, but very innovative, all in order to keep the house free of ducts, grills, and equipment. Uh, cool air coming in here gets into the house. Eventually, if it gets to be 95 degrees high humidity, it becomes chilled air. Uh, if it goes worse than that, one side becomes uh, supply and the other returns instead of two returns. Uh, and that's a, that's a big topic. Uh, one, one project that we're engaged with right now uh, is adding back this 100-foot wing on one side of the house that he built five years after first occupying the house in 1814. These wings come right out of Palladio's four books from the 16th century. Um, service rooms that have covered passages. Um, this was the archaeology of half the wing that disappeared in the 1840s, perhaps related to the, the fire. Uh, we had uh, foundations, walls, floors, doorways, uh, the other two parts, that room and this room, rebuilt as two separate buildings. They were there but altered, uh, needing uh, a lot of repair. Uh, this is Monticello. Uh, the chimney is too short here, and Jefferson never had this stuff on there. So uh, we still have any time left. What does all this mean? Uh, this is obviously a a complicated question here, but this has many meanings, uh, no matter you know, what you want to look at. Just looking at the architectural lineage of this, we can see uh, Palladian influence in the symmetry of this. Uh, we see French influences, the alcove beds, the skylights. We can look at uh, a major Palladian influence, which is this cube room that really creates a, uh, a rotunda house. Uh, we know Jefferson was enamored with Palladio's Villa Rotunda because he tried to do, this is the Villa Rotunda, he tried to do one of those for the governor's house in Richmond in the 1780s, and he entered an anonymous competition for the White House to do another Villa Rotunda. He never did them. Poplar Forest was his one and last chance to do one. In terms of details, Jefferson was, was into all the classical details, uh, starting with this Tuscan hierarchy uh, at the bottom outside. Uh, you enter into the dining room, which has this Doric baths of Diocletian. Tuscan, Doric, uh, and yet Jefferson uh, adds things to that proper order. And when questioned by the New York sculptor who made these frieze elements, Jefferson said, this is my own house and I can indulge my fancy. If this was a public house, I would follow authority strictly. That really says everything about this whole site. It's for his eyes only. The third room in the hierarchy is the Ionic order. Uh, Temple Fortuna Virilis, one of his favorites, where he does follow authority strictly. We know it looked exactly like that. It was the same man made the same ornaments for the University of Virginia, and they're still on the wall. Uh, the house was described as being like a French chateau. Floors of polished oak, 
uh, large windows, French mirrors. Uh, Jefferson loved the quality of light and airiness after living in French houses. Uh, bed alcoves, definitely French. Uh, Jefferson loved these things. Here's his own bedroom at Monticello, and this is what the beds look like at Poplar Forest. Being part of, of two walls parallel to each other, rising to the ceiling. If you close the three doorways at Poplar Forest, the rooms are only open across there. Forced, a forced ventilation in the summer. Um, this kind of technology borrowed from something in Europe. Uh, this tricky way of, of getting a flat roof that, that drains water. Uh, this really becomes a melting pot of all these things Jefferson collects in his lifetime. You can call him Jeffersonian for sure, but I think we can call him the first of an American architecture. He's not just pulling from the British, he's pulling from the Romans, the idea of the villa. He's pulling from the Renaissance, Palladio. He's pulling from the 18th century French, 18th century British, and maybe 18th century Germans. But we've, we've learned not about all the big stuff, but about the little stuff. Uh, when you see a peach pit spit into the mortar by one of Hugh Chisholm's hands in 1807, I think there's something poignant about that. Uh, we've learned so much about the anonymous hands at work at Poplar Forest. You know, the little idiosyncrasies of, of filling little spaces with chunks of brick. Uh, I mean, to me, that was worth everything to save, so we carefully saved that part of the mortar joint when this had to be taken out. Uh, I think that's as important as, as anything. Uh, seeing how the mason in, in 1807 slapped down stuff from his trowel, I had the modern mason duplicate that and it looked exactly the same. There's some, some kind of interesting connections that, that you can feel. Uh, finding these little holes in the wall, uh, those were where they stuck the line that held the string to get the course right. Uh, here's what we always thought they looked like out of an 18th century book. Uh, lo and behold, Monticello found one used by the same mason that fell down in a chimney hole at Monticello. I borrowed that, took it to Poplar Forest, and it fit like a glove. You know, one of those real neat moments, uh, the, the feeling the workers. Um, let me just tell you a couple other things. Uh, I'm going on a little bit, but if you'll indulge me. The landscape is, is very significant. Here's what's left of the poplar forest, about 1900. Jefferson really tries to marry, always, landscape and architecture. The landscape was really uh, his connection to nature. The big windows really created indoor-outdoor spaces. Landscape was just as much of an art form. It was very unique and expressive. He created a design that incorporated three essential landscapes, the ornamental grounds around the house, the, agri the, the larger curtilage, the outer yard, and the plantation landscape. He even mentioned which mountains you could see out of each window of the house, although I'm not convinced he could really see them. Um, there are a number of things that we could say about the, the architectural, those are the those were the trees left in 1989. Uh, four of those are gone. There are many things we can say about the architecture, starting with the idea of the villa. Uh, to the Romans, uh, the villa was a place you escaped to from the city to a, a very ornamental place for pleasure, but it was always surrounded by a vernacular agricultural landscape. This is a, a kind of a good concept of the villa, uh, the ornamental core in that agricultural setting. One of the, the really interesting things about Poplar Forest is the idealism. Uh, beyond the, the neoclassical uh, version, the, the neoclassical movement of which Poplar Forest was a, one of the best American versions, you can talk about things that are uh, somewhat uh, poetic and, and intangible. 
Jefferson's design of Poplar Forest as a villa really grew out of the intense programmatic investment of his of ideological goals. In giving shape to his architectural and ideological ideals, Jefferson really gave shape to universal human concerns. Uh, James Ackerman notes in his history of the villa that the social underpinning of the villa culture was more consistent than that of any other social manifestation in Western society over the same period. In the middle room of Poplar Forest was the ideal of, of human reason rendered in space. Uh, author Gary Wills in an article uh, said that Poplar Forest was Jefferson's last dramatic marriage of classical art and the American wilderness. We can also talk about uh, the sort of Vitruvian man image of this uh, landscape. Uh, these being the mounds that act like wings for a five-part Palladian plan. All of this on a 50-foot grid, which is established by the house. Um, all sorts of, of interesting threads, but uh, this is really comparable to that ideal cosmology. And for this kind of stuff, uh, a little poetic and, and maybe stretching things, I can use some words of, of one of the great uh, poets of architectural history, Vincent Scully, who said about Poplar Forest that this was the man of perfect proportions. And this image of the house and landscape uh, as idealistic images had really dominated European aesthetics from antiquity through the Renaissance with a vision of heroic mankind proportionately in accord with the ideal shapes of the circle and square. The image shaped by the great French gardens of the 17th century, which Jefferson loved so well, it was their portraiture, their revelation of humanity's position in the center of the universe, which seems to emerge as Jefferson's final intention at Poplar Forest. Let me just skip a few things. Jefferson really uh, pursued his own happiness at the end of his life uh, when he had the liberty to do so. It's really kind of the happy ending to his life. Jefferson's use of the house is a happy story. Uh, these shapes, these features, really constituted a private, simplified retreat for a remarkable man of the Enlightenment. It was really a physical place for the soul and center of an intellectual universe. After contributing so much to public life, Jefferson resumed his private life as an individual at Poplar Forest, away from the distractions at Monticello. One of the granddaughters said that at Poplar Forest he had the power to do what he liked best, to read, to write, and to think. I like that quote, he had the power finally to do what he wanted. Poplar Forest really re represented his own pursuit of happiness that had been left off at the revolution. At Poplar Forest, Jefferson had turned back to studying the classics, going back to the basics to really recapture the inspiration from his early heroes who had sustained and shaped his intellect. The library at Poplar Forest consisted of Jefferson's 600 favorite books in a small format, most of which were in their original languages, chosen just for this retreat. He characterized his personal focus during retirement with a renewed joy and said, I have given up newspapers in exchange for Cassius and Thucydides, for Newton and Euclid, and I find myself much the happier. I read nothing, therefore, but of the heroes of Troy, the wars of Lacedaemon and Athens, of Pompey and Caesar and of Augustus too. I slumber without fear. I review in my dreams the visions of antiquity, which is a wonderful statement about his joy of, of shedding all the other things in his life when he had an opportunity to do so. The ages old stimulus of a retreat for Jefferson, which he had tried to do over and over since boyhood, this really refreshed Jefferson's own mind and prepared him for one last idealistic and symbolic public work, the University of Virginia. He did a lot of that designing and thinking in this quiet house. 
At, at UVA, he hoped the development of the human mind could prove that the freedom was there to shape a better world just as his own had been shaped. One of my uh, delights uh, and memorable occurrences was uh, showing two men around in the dead of winter with nobody else around, Vincent Scully and his former student, David McCullough, the historian. McCullough, I basically listened to them talk, and it, uh, I wish I had a tape recording. McCullough later wrote about his visit. More and more it's becoming, actually, let me read the, uh, the Scully quote first. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is the end, I promise. Uh, Scully said at Poplar Forest, what this slide relates to, as Poplar Forest is reshaped before our eyes, back to the way Jefferson wanted it to be, it calls up his great ghost in ever more palpable form, and other American shades loom around him, making the restoration the most moving event for me in recent architectural history. McCullough's take and experience was this, he said, more and more it's becoming clear how very important Poplar Forest is to our enlarged understanding of Thomas Jefferson and the reach of his imagination. That Jefferson was, along with so many other things, one of the premier American architects has long been appreciated, but the originality and ingenuity of Poplar Forest, especially now that it is being so superbly restored raise his standard still higher. This is an American masterpiece by a great American artist who also happened to be President of the United States. Thank you.